Good evening, everyone, uh, to our latest Chifley conversation. Um, once more, we're internet challenge tonight. Our internet excuse of the night is that three of us are coming from the Melbourne area um, and that the earthquake. Hi everyone, my name is Daisy uh, and I work as the organiser for the Chifley Research Centre. Uh, David's Wi-Fi is frequently a little haywire, he's in regional Victoria and I think this evening uh, the earthquake has really set things off. I know there was a blackout in the local 10 News panel. Uh, so as for now I'm going to quickly jump in and uh, Ray, Angela and Milo, if you want to turn your cameras on, uh, we can get started quickly until David can jump in again. Okay, just going to turn the sound off on my iPad and we will get started with introductions. Is that David coming back in? I think so. I think so. We'll give him a chance, will we? Yeah. <laughs> well, you can just be a self chairing panel. Yeah, that's right. I think we're probably more than capable, but. Why don't we give that a shot? I reckon he's not coming back. Yeah. Um, look, I'll start off because I'm meant to be speaking first. So my name is Dr Angela Jackson. I'd like um, to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the lands where I'm calling from tonight and the lands where everyone is um, around Australia tonight, different lands. And I encourage people to comment on that in the chat and let us know where you're calling from. So I'm calling from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We've had an eventful day here today, as many of you have heard, an earthquake, one of the first and biggest ones I think uh, recorded in Melbourne. So it's been a big day and obviously that's causing some, some issues. Um, our other panellists tonight, and I'll, I'll throw to them, uh, we have Professor Ray Cooper. Ray, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, Ange. How are you? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Professor Ray Cooper and I'm at the University of Sydney in the Business School. Um, and I'm tonight, I'm on beautiful Gadigal land in Sydney and I don't have Wi-Fi problems, I hope. Uh, and hi, everyone. My name's Jamila Rizvi. I'm the Chief Creative Officer at Future Women. I also write books and talk too much for a living. And I'm coming to you from Wurundjeri country, part of the Kulin Nation in Nam. And I was rocked by the earthquake, didn't know what it was. Took me about 10 minutes, but my kid thought it was the best thing that's happened in lockdown. Back to you, man. <laughs> I wonder Thank if you. it is. It might be. <laughs> oh, look, it when it brings light relief, I think that was my comment today, when an earthquake brings light relief, you know, things have got a bit serious. Um, so look, thank you for everyone for joining us uh, tonight. The, the idea behind, I think, that David had around this was really addressing the issue around women and COVID and what it means in terms of the future of work. Um, and so what we're going to do tonight as a panel is sort of go through some of the major issues. I'm going to cover off where we were before COVID hit. Uh, Ray is going to have a specific look at uh, what COVID has done and some of the research that she's been doing. And Jamila's going to come in at the end with some of the stories and some of the you know, information that she's, she's gathered, both from her work at Future Women and in the media, but also the recent book that she's obviously released, which will be great to hear as well. So women in Australia, how is it going? Um, it's an interesting one. And I think it's one we didn't really have a lot of conversations about maybe in the mainstream media anyway, until maybe last year. But Australia wasn't going that great. So we were dropping backwards coming into COVID-19. In fact, if we look at the World Economic Forum's Gender Gap Index, we were 15th in the world in 1995, so doing pretty well. And by the year 2020, we dropped to 44th. Uh, and last year, we dropped to 50th in the world. So women in Australia, relative to our counterparts overseas, were not doing as well. We weren't making as much progress going forward. We still had a gender pay gap of around 14%, which was relatively significant. Um, and women were retiring with 44% of the super of men. 
And this is one of the reasons why, um, young children, just two seconds. <laughs> young children interrupting women and their careers. Um, it's one of the bigger issues. It is one of the big issues. There's no doubt about that in terms of what drives, um, drives the gap between men and women, but there are other things at play as well. So if we think about um, in terms of what is driving this gap and why it hasn't closed in Australia, there's a lot to do with discrimination still. So, you know, we know that women come from a base where we didn't even have the right to vote couldn't join parliament, uh, had to quit our jobs if we got married, all these fantastic things that really encourage women to do well, um, often when encouraged to go to university. Um, now, a lot of that discrimination and that structural discrimination has faded away, but a lot of it still remains. Uh, and so women will often still earn less for the same amount of work as men. Um, there are also issues around childbearing in Australia where we do encourage this model of care where women are encouraged to take time out of the workforce to take a break. Uh, men are encouraged to be the primary earner and we have a tax and welfare system and a political system that really supports that model. Uh, and what that does is it keeps women stuck in part-time care. Um, and there are a number of other issues at play as well. One of the things I think that there had been a focus on really was around fixing women previously. So we've seen a lot of stuff around women leaning in more, about getting women into STEM, that women are the problem. But a lot of the research actually shows that's not how it works, that when women lean in, they don't necessarily get rewarded. Uh, when more women go into an occupation or a profession, wages go down. Um, but there are those systematic issues still at play. So the question really is, well, then how do we change that? And what are some of the policy settings? Well, part of it from an economist point of view, I guess there's two big things. Um, one is around gender responsive budgeting. One is around saying we want gender equity. That's an actual goal from both a social but also an economic perspective. Um, and then what decisions are we making to get to that objective? And so gender responsive budgeting is about looking at how governments spend money, what are government policies and making sure that we understand how they impact men and women differently. The second thing, and it's related to that as an economist, is how we view the household. So the household currently contributes about 50% of economic output in this country. It's not measured, uh, that's one big problem, but we seem to see it very much as policymakers as something that's not our concern, that that household optimizes itself. And we do this in politics, we do this uh, and, and we do it as an economist. And what that means is we're not interested in how the policies that we formulate influence those decisions within the household, where 50% of the production in the economy is happening. And that's a real failure at the moment because actually households can't be considered as one unit. They are separate units. And we do need to think about how policies impact different people in that household. And that's one of the big drivers in terms of the policy failings, I think, in Australia, where we have you know, the household income and labour dynamic survey. So it looks at the household. We do a lot around household income. We don't think about things enough in terms of each individual optimising their choices. Um, that's where I'll leave it in terms of where we got to pre-COVID and I'll throw to Ray who's, um, we'll talk about how COVID made everything worse. I feel like I'm not so much worse. Good, thanks. Um, so all of those issues that um, Angela's talked about there, um, she's right, they were exacerbated and amplified during the period of COVID. And I, I shouldn't speak in past tense because we're very much still in the middle of the pandemic, aren't we? Um, so we've tried to, in our research team, talk about the way that COVID has impacted women is that um, it, there's been a triple whammy um, in terms of what the impact's been. Um, the first one has been that women um, almost immediately lost more jobs and more hours in those very first lockdowns um, in 2020. Um, that's because of the pre-existing um, quite significant um, gendered segregations across occupations and across um, industries and the labour force generally. So we know those sectors that shut really quickly are, um, you know, um, accommodation, tourism, restaurants, you know, even areas like the arts um, shut down pretty quickly. Uh, they're all very highly feminised sectors. So the jobs loss, and not just the jobs loss, but the hours loss um, was a very feminised um, phenomenon in 2020. And I'll come back to 2021 in a tick. Um, so the second 
right, I just muted myself somehow. Um, the second whammy really was that we have a very feminized front line. So the front line um, dealing with COVID um, is a bit different to, you know, what we saw particularly in New South Wales, but actually nationally about the disaster we had the summer before, which was the bushfire crisis. Um, this time it's really been a very pink um, front line. Um, and in that, you know, we think immediately of the nurses and, and ancillary staff that work around um, health, but I also think of um, the staff uh, who are the front line as being those who work in um, health and care more broadly, but also uh, retail. And we've seen, um, you know, sort of a two speed kind of thing going on in, in retail where um, some areas like fashion retail has absolutely died through COVID um, because of the shutdowns. But we've seen areas like uh, food retail supermarkets actually really increasing it. And there is, they're very dangerous places to work. So those, um, those women who are um, on that front line um, also happen to be very undervalued relative to the, the wages that they're earning. So we saw, for example, in the UK through uh, 2020, there was a sort of clap for the NHS, um, which was, you know, people coming out of their house at six, six o'clock in the evening and giving a good old clap to the nurses and, and the work that they were doing. Um, you know, the nurses unions there have sort of arced up a bit and said we need more than clapping to pay our bills um, because those workers, and that's a highly, that's a more professional kind of sector, I guess, um, nursing, but those areas are very, uh, it's like we've got, we've got these two visitors, this is really just making our point. I wish I could insert a child. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, we did not this arrange me, this. It gets me directly onto my next point, which is that women have shouldered even more of the burden um, in terms of unpaid uh, labour at home. Um, even when they're extremely famous, like these two are, um, they've still got kids who are talking to them. And I've got to say, we enjoy seeing them there. Um, so um, women stepped in to the period of COVID well behind men um, in terms of uh, how free they are, in terms of that what household labour does to them. Um, so women did double the hours of unpaid work, whether that's looking after kids or looking after others at home and doing all the other work of social reproduction in the home that, as Angela points out, is so critical to our economy. During uh, the COVID period, that's doubled again. So men stepped up a little bit, but the gap has actually got wider. So we've gone backwards on a lot of those measures. I probably would add in the fourth whammy at the moment, which is that the way in which um, government has responded to this um, problem is almost answering a question that wasn't asked. Um, so we'll see where this, where a stimulus um, gone, um, and it's primarily been aimed at construction and those, which is one of the most highly male dominated sectors in the economy and has barely had a downturn. I won't comment on what's going on in Melbourne today. Um, 2021, um, basically the same thing happened, but women are in whiplash in 2021 because it was kind of like it was almost over, then it's happened again. And in fact, it looks even worse this time in terms of the impact of all of those things on women. We don't have a proper sort of take on all of that from ABS data that's available, but that which we can access shows that more, like particularly if we just, I'm sort of interested in New South Wales because that's where I am. Um, but we know that about 140,000 women have lost jobs during the lockdowns in, in New South Wales, um, and about 85% of them lost their jobs in the first three or four weeks. Um, so that's a really significant um, challenge. We still have that highly feminised front line, but what we know is that the frontline workers are struggling because they don't have the care, the paid care, whether that's through school or preschools, um, sometimes in the form of early childhood education. So they've just, you know, it's a, it's a almost impossible kind of situation that they're dealing with. Um, and also we know that things like, um, because of those things, that participation uh, rates have dropped. We're at an all time high, I think Angela said this, in late 2019. We bounced back um, in March, 2020 and the, um, uh, March, yeah, March this year, sorry, 2021, the government was crowing about how amazing that was and how we bounced back in a pink fashion. We're right back down under that again now. So what we walked in with in terms of the gender gaps um, has actually um, been amplified, um, has been aggravated during this period. Um, and I don't see at the moment any signs that what we're trying to do is to design for gender equality as we're trying to build back um, into the period of recovery. Thanks for that, Ray. Do you know what, what are you hearing? Uh, so you've got two people who I think are perhaps the best placed in the whole country to give you the data view of what's been going on for women. So I thought what might be useful from my perspective is to bring you some of the stories of how this is impacting women on the ground. I've been working on a book with Future Women the last little while called Work, Love, Body that looks at the impact of the pandemic on women's working lives, their relationships and also their health. 
And on top of that, we've been running a whole series of focus groups at Future Women around what women are going through and what they're experiencing during the pandemic. So I thought what might be worth saying to begin with, echoing what both Angela and Ray have said, is that COVID-19 didn't create these inequalities, but as always happens in a crisis, the existing fault lines have been ripped open under the pressure of fear, loss, and the threat for many women, quite genuinely, of a descent into poverty. We know that around half a million Australian women lost their jobs in 2020, and that was just the first year of the pandemic. And again, while many found work again, while we were the first back, we were then the first out the door again when 2021's uh, lockdowns began. So we have these kind of push forwards, push back, but the net outcome is bad for women. And um, one of the women we met in one of our focus groups was a woman called Maria. Maria's in her late fifties. She migrated to Australia from Italy uh, when she was a teenager. She described herself as both lucky and hardworking. She talks about the fact that when her father died, he left her enough money for a deposit on a small house in outer Melbourne. She has since then lived very carefully. Um, she has a small mortgage to pay, but it's a big mortgage in her terms. She has two children living at home. For the last 15 years, Maria has done little bits of extra cleaning work. She does a big trip to her local market. She also makes soups, casseroles, pies, lasagnas. They're delicious, I can promise, to fill this chest freezer that she has at home. She told us how her two teenage sons can eat an entire lasagna each themselves. And so she always has lost, lots stocked away. She said that when the pandemic began in 2020, that freezer saved her life and saved her boys' lives. She said she had two months of meals stored away and she lost all of her cleaning clients at once because she could no longer go into their homes because she was in quite informal cleaning work. A lot of her um, work didn't qualify her for government supports and she would have been in real trouble if she hadn't had that food put away for her and her family. She talked to us about the fact that that chest freezer stopped working uh, in about May of 2020. She couldn't afford to replace it. She kept as many of the lasagnas and the pies that she could in her smaller freezer, but it just wasn't enough. She ended up having to throw a bunch of food away. And for her, throwing away more than $300 worth of food was a huge impact. Um, Maria ended up having to sell the home. She and the boys now live in social housing. And again, Maria repeated how lucky they were to be in that social housing because there are so many Australians who are on waiting lists wishing to be in the kind of situation that Maria is in. And yet life is pretty tough for her right now. We also met a woman called Jane. Uh, Jane is in her early 40s and she talks about the experience she has had uh, living with her mother who is on the aged pension, which uh, at the time of writing is about $68 a day. And Jane talks to us about that $68 a day. She talked to us in the focus groups about doing grocery shopping for her mum and doing this kind of small shop. It wasn't a big shop. It was one of those like get the extra stuff you need kind of shops. And she had to get some vegetables, some nuts for a stir fry. She got some muesli. She got a loaf of bread, some dog food, laundry power, packet of Oreos, uh, because everyone deserves some Oreos sometimes. Um, total was $45. And that was, of course, before Jane's mum had paid her electricity bill, her phone bill, her water bill. Um, it doesn't include the price of petrol or train tickets to get you where you're going. Um, doesn't include the cost of having to fix a broken heel on your boots or new underwear or filling a script at the chemist. Doesn't include your rent. Gave her $26 left, $26 left from a very basic shop. And Jane talks about putting the Oreos back and deciding it wasn't worth it. Um, Jane herself is a little bit better off than her mum, but she also talked to us about her personal decision to draw down on her superannuation during the pandemic to help get her through. And she did that in the full knowledge of how much that would cost her in retirement. Um, that as a woman just, just, uh, just into her 40s, she took $20,000 out of her super. That's about $250,000 in retirement. And as she makes the point to us, um, that's not just Oreo money, that's a whole lot more than that, that she was losing into the future. And I'll give you one more example, which was another woman we met called Kate. Um, 
Kate, when she was 20 something, uh, married a bloke called Henry. She left him 16 years later when she was 38. Um, in their time together, Henry was hugely violent. Um, he inflicted multiple fractures on Kate and a bunch of punches to the head, which actually left Kate with an acquired brain injury. She had trouble in our discussions explaining to us how that injury affected her, but with some support from her sister, she was able to describe some of the symptoms. She talked about her headaches and how they come out of nowhere and it feels like she's just been hit in the head again. She talks about taking painkillers, um, but she also talks about not being able to find the painkillers, not remembering where they are, um, not being able to recall where she put them last time. She talks about how angry it makes her that short-term memory loss and not being able to cope. Kate's tried so many times to get a job, um, sometimes successfully, but because of her brain in injury and damage to her ankles and wrists, she said the jobs don't last very long. Uh, she struggles to comprehend Centrelink's requirements. And as a result of not being able to comprehend those requirements, she spent the last few years bouncing between paid work, between unemployment benefits and the disability allowance. Um, Several times in the last 10 years, Kate says she's lost those welfare payments due to her, her inability to understand with understand and comply with Centrelink's bureaucratic demands. Those demands were lesser for the coronavirus supplement. They were easier. When she received that supplement, she didn't have to worry about reporting all her failed job applications to Centrelink. She said she spent the extra money she had on warm clothes for the winters ahead. She bought a new electric blanket and she paid for a ton of online sessions with her counsellor. Uh, we checked in with her again March of this year to see how she was going. Kate told us that after an entire year of actually being able to access regular therapy, she was dealing better with the memory loss. She was dealing better with the fear and anger that she had experienced. Her depression was under control for the first time since she'd become ill following uh, the violence from her former partner. She talked to us about how she was terrified by the end of the coronavirus supplement and the creation of the Job Dobber hotline. This initiative's where employers can job in, dob in uh, people on Job Seeker who re refuse to do a job or perform badly in an interview. The thing that struck me about Kate is that for her, and I think like so many other Australians, 2020 was probably her best year ever uh, because she had access to money that she had never had previously. And so what I'm trying to do with those three stories is give you an idea of just how diverse the impacts of COVID have been while at the same time giving you that overall picture of how tough women are doing it. Thanks, Jamila. I mean, the other thing it illustrates to me is how much we seem to be dependent on anecdotes to lift the lid on some of these, these issues. I mean, the longer run challenges that Angela introduced and then what Ray's been describing in terms of the impact of COVID. And I mean, I, I think Ray was also alluding to the fact that it's been a two-stage story so far, and it's been a little bit uncertain. We're seeing some trends. We're being able to draw some conclusions, but not entirely. So there we are, sort of back to anecdotes. And there seems this disproportionate impact on women being affected by being on the front line. And you know, perhaps another thing to draw out there is they're exposed to greater dangers being on the front line. Um, Anecdotes are not things that policymakers typically respond to. So I put it to all of you. Someone can take the lead here. How do we deal with this? I mean, how do we deal with this challenge of determining the things that we haven't been very good at measuring even before COVID and they seem to be exacerbated by COVID? 
Look, I think we do. Oh, sorry, where you go. I think we can measure and I think we do measure. So we know 60% of the job losses in Sydney right now are female job losses, 40% male. Um, we can see that it's young women predominantly as well that have really been impacted. So out of those job losses, you know, young people, 19 to 24, about 15% of the labour market, they again have been, I think, around 40% of the job losses and most of those have been young women. So we can see these stats. Uh, we can see how lifetime earnings, how, you know, women who have kids earn $2 million less than their husbands over the life course um, we can see that and we can see you know all these trends and all these impacts um, I think from a policymaker's point of view uh, where it falls down is there is a little bit of an issue around how they analyze policy so it's not necessarily that they can't see how you know a tax cut for example will impact the male and the female in the household it's just that they do the cameo on the household um, and we often see it you know paid parental leave is another example where my right to access paid parental leave is based on my husband's income now you know is that right like we, we see we see policy through this household uh, I guess construct in this country and we make that decision whereas the data we can do it on the individual level so I think the anecdote and the stories are important because they highlight the impact of that like they highlight the impact of the fact that we know that single income women, single parent female families are the poorest families in Australia and what that actually means, um, you know, in terms of will I have enough food to feed my kids or not? Um, I think they're important, but I think the data also shows us that. The data tells us that that is the biggest group experiencing poverty in this country. Um, and that's a huge issue, right? Like, you know, single parents, single mums, um, you know, are, are a group who we don't want to be poor because we know that if they're poor, the, the life chances of their kids are going to be poorer too. So I think it's it's not so much the data isn't there. I think it's the lens with which we approach that yeah. data isn't I can, there. I completely agree with you, Ange. And um, the, the, we have so much data. Like <laughs> you know, we have too much data, you know, like people like me and Ange who spend their entire lives pouring through ABS and, you know, credit card data and all the rest of it. We, we, we know the story. We knew the story before. We have a highly segregated labour force. We have highly undervalued female labour force, despite the fact that we have the best educated prime age female labour force in the OECD. We have the data. The problem is, um, and look, I would also say, I don't think what, what Jamila's talking about there is not anecdotes. What Jamila's doing there is telling us the stories of women's lives. Um, and I think in terms of both... Mm -hmm those things, so the broader you know, the macro data, um, but also the stories of individual women's lives and what this means to them in their home, um, in their career, in, in their relationships, um, needs to be listened to. Um, and we need to stop um, assuming that, you know, that the, that we, uh, how hard is it? We can't tell what the problem is. We know what the bloody problem is. Um, and we need to actually listen to women, look at the data in a gender disaggregated way and try to find a solution to some of those really massive inequalities that are both across our labour force, across our sectors, across our, across our you know, in, inside the uh, stratification of our organisations and in our homes. I'm not sure what I can add that, um, Ray, Sorry. Uh, yeah. haven't already said but I will for a moment just say I think stories are powerful and I think stories are important I think it's important that we bring stories to the table <coughs> that are reflective of a larger issue and that are reflective of what the data tells us but I do think they aid a conversation because I think people process information in different ways some prefer the data the data aspect for others it's not going to hit home the numbers aren't going to hit home until they hear the real stories and we know often it is those individual stories that are the way we convince people uh, when we're talking face to face and certainly when it comes to the media we are always looking for a story because we know we can't go it on the data alone because we can't get people's attention and I think when it comes to policy change that requires political will and if we're going to get that political will, we have to be able to tell the stories as well. Yeah. So there, is there a consensus here that we should be starting with these, these stories to, as it were, impose from outside on policymakers a greater appreciation of what's going on? No, I think they're complementary. I think they absolutely speak to each other and just tell the same story in a slightly different voice. Um, I just The problem is not the voice. Yeah. The problem is the ears and the way that people listen to that and try to understand the, the, um, 
inequalities that um, both the all sorts of data show to us, whether it's the stories that women tell us or whether it's the stories that the ABS tells us. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Ray, you've, for example, articulated these things very succinctly, you know, down to sort of four dot points on, on some occasions. Um, how do we get, what do we do about those years? I mean, as, <laughs> um, you know, has, has any, anyone uh, got an alternate su suggestion for just opening, opening those ears or we, it's just a, a case of plugging away? Well, that's a good question. And I think, um, I think all three of us would probably agree that if we knew the answer to that, we'd be already sort of working, working on strategies to make it happen. I think there is mm. actually a change going on. And um, I think it actually is um, pretty obvious over the last, particularly the last two or three years, that women have had enough of not being listened to, actually. And, um, you know, as a mother of a couple of teens, um, who are, one of whom is a very strong uh, feminist and um, knows how to use her voice, um, I just think this next generation that's coming through is not going to put up with some of the garbage that the Generation X and the boomers have put up with um, um, in, in terms of, um, you know, their working lives, um, they're being spoken down to, they're being spoken over, them not being treated as real workers or real professionals. So, um, I, 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 look, I think at your peril, um, politicians, policymakers, um, employers, at your peril, don't listen to that voice because it's powerful. Um, and I don't think that the what is basically the future workforce uh, is going to put up with it anymore. So I don't know. Uh, I just I think that on a cost benefit analysis and in terms of what that means in terms of whether you get the labour that you need in your business and you have the, the skills that you need, whether you have the people who will vote for you because you're representing their interests or whatever other measure it is, I, I just think it's um, it might just come down to the self-interest of listening to those voices that are being raised. Yeah, I think Ray's right. I mean, I, I at the same time. Yeah. Sorry, no, I was just going to say in terms of people listening, I think a, a couple of things are happening. I think there's a younger generation coming through politically who are simply not going to not be listened to, who have, um, they expect like full and true equality, I think, in a way that probably my generation did too, but we sort of accepted when it didn't arrive. I don't know, like, I don't know what exactly happened there because I think we were brought up that we were equal, but then... Um, obviously there was some socialization that went on the structures at play in terms of the way maternity leave the baby bonus worked all those sort of things we sort of still got taken down this line that wasn't necessarily equity um, and thus Australian women are going back relative to the rest of the world and I think COVID changed a lot like I think um, the experience of lockdown homeschooling the caring responsibilities uh, I think that was a, a collective experience that changed perceptions about the role of women in the household. And why am I the one who's doing this? Like, I mean, I had this argument with my husband or discussion, let's say it wasn't quite an argument, but I'm not good at homeschooling. Like my skill set in this is no better or worse than yours. So why am I doing this? Like we're doing this equally. And I think for a lot of women, the penny dropped that they carry a lot, they do a lot just because and not necessarily for any really good reason and that changed a lot of discussions in the household and I think generated a degree of anger and a degree of unacceptance of the status quo in Australia where you know it isn't that women don't do more work than men we do more work it's just it's not paid um, and you know there is the, the setup and the expectation is even though we're better educated even, even though, you know, that, that we do more of this unpaid work and the blokes get to do the paid work, they get the economic security, they get the power in society. And I think, I think for a lot of Australian women, young women, but I think even, you know, older than that, that's, it's, it, it, the time's up on that, you know, and it's not acceptable anymore. Um, and so I think there will be change. And I think the politics of it is, you know, the current Liberal government obviously sees that this is an issue, you know, and they obviously see that they need to, you know, this last budget, they clearly, you know, try to address it. Um, and through the Women's Summit, obviously, the Security Summit. But there is still, I think, a huge political opportunity to really articulate what women want, which is, I, th I think, a world where our skills and our expertise are supported and we're allowed to reach our full potential. 
because at the moment the system's not allowing Australian women to do that. And that does us a disservice as individuals, but it does our country a disservice as well. Um, and I think for the political leadership and the will to articulate that vision um, is in, would be incredibly powerful and, and really speak, I think, to where Australian women are right now. Can I jump in perhaps on the communication question and on how you talk to people about these issues, particularly about workplaces? And um, at Future Women, we run a whole bunch of leadership courses that for that are for women. And for some time, I felt uncomfortable about them because I have this sense of us taking the women, telling them what's wrong with them and telling them we'll try and fix it. When we're not fixing the other half of the gender equality equ equation, which is also the bigger half, which is the blokes. And so in the second half of this year, that's what we're going to start doing. And the way we're running those courses, which are for men, which focus on how to be a gender equal leader, how to be a manager of women, how to be a good colleague of women, how to be a good employee of women, is about gender equity and respect. But it also goes deeper than that. And the way we're selling it in is, yes, this is important, this stuff, because it is good for the women in your lives. But also, this is important because it was good for you, because gender inequality hurts men in non-financial ways. It hurts men in more emotional and social ways. I know that from looking at the older men in my life. I know that from my dad who commented this morning that he spends more time on Zoom with my little boy at the moment than he ever did with his own kids when we were young because he didn't have that opportunity. So yes, it hurts blokes. And also if we can get to gender equality, it's good for organizations. And we've got countless data that shows that organizations that have gender diverse boards, gender diverse senior executives are more profitable, more effective and more innovative. So this is a win, win, win. This isn't just about what's good for women. It's about what's good for women, what's good for men and what's good for our organizations. So for me, it's, it is genuinely a no brainer if we can get the communication right. Jamila, you say it's a no brainer um, and you, you talk about all of the benefits that employers can derive if they get the sort of thing that you are talking about. Yet at the same time, we've had a situation pre-COVID, which has been emphasised during COVID, that emergent forms of work, casualisation, um, the patterns of work in areas like the caring sector, which have become large employers of women, but will be large employers of Australia, all Australians, male and female, and larger, loom larger in our future economy, there are areas that exacerbate the sorts of problems that you were talking about. What's to say that these employers who might get the rhetoric at the moment during the period of COVID don't revert back? How do we ensure that people don't backslide and they think about emergent forms of work and indeed existing forms of work that have imposed some of these issues that we've been talking about? Well, I think when I said I, I felt the argument was convincing, I, I didn't mean that I'd convinced everyone yet. Um, I certainly don't feel like we've got <laughs> the majority of corporate or government leaders or even not-for-profit leaders on board in this space yet. I think there are some who are starting to get it, but I think this is a long conversation and there's a lot of convincing to do. And if I, if I can be... If I can say the thing that I think we're all thinking but it's hard to say out loud is that if you have always experienced a life of privilege within the workplace, which many men have, then equality doesn't look so desirable. Because if you have always been in the privileged group who holds the majority of positions, who gets paid the most, who has the best shot at being CEO, a reminder now that there are more CEOs in the top 200 companies in Australia right now called Andrew than there are women, there were no women CEOs appointed amongst those companies in the last 12 months. If you are amongst that privileged group and you have seen your father and your grandfather before him experience that privilege, then equality doesn't look so good. You've got to be convinced on the equality. When you look at it purely in a workplace lens, that doesn't look like much fun. That looks like you get less of the pie than others. Um, that doesn't mean it's not equality and equality isn't still worth fighting for. So for me, I think it's about broadening that conversation and broadening that conversation to talk about what work is 
and what work is worth because the unpaid work women are doing is still work. It is still valuable. Our economies and our country doesn't function without it. And we know that because of the number of women who've given up their paid work to stay at home because kids don't school themselves, houses don't clean themselves. That work still has to be done whether or not we ascribe a dollar value to it or not. I'll ask the economists here. I mean, there's been a general conversation about what is full employment in an age like we live in now. But what about the question is of what is full-time employment and indeed how relevant is our old concept of full-time employment when we're dealing with issues like this? Should we be Thank having you. a conversation about that? about what the future of work looks like and, and the flexibility around that. I mean, I look, I think that, um, you know, women do take a lot of part-time work, and but they're also underemployed. Sorry, am I? No, yeah, I'm talking. Um, they're also underemployed. So a lot of women are filling those part-time roles at the moment, but I think there's a perception that isn't necessarily married with reality about how much women want to work. So women report wanting to work more hours um, compared to men. And, you know, in so underemployment of women is much higher than men. Um, but certainly, you know, flexibility, uh, designing work around those family responsibilities and, and accepting those as part of, you know, normal life of the society that, you know, those family responsibilities do need to be met is important. And COVID has, I think, hastened, you know, in some workplaces where it's possible and if that's, you know, they are office-based jobs, they're not necessarily, um, you know, those low for, uh, sort of customer-facing or aged care jobs. So it's a certain cohort of women that there is, I think, an opportunity there for greater equity. Um, but then there are other jobs that women are doing in our economy, which are those caring jobs, which are just, you know, systematically undervalued, right? I mean, the, the work of an aged care worker, um, the work of a childcare worker, um, we pay them, even though the skills associated with that, those jobs are, are very high, the work is tough. Um, you know, it is dangerous work as, as COVID-19 has shown, they, they get paid very, very lowly. Um, and so there are some of those systematic issues that also need to come into play in terms of how much we pay um, and how much we pay some of those professions that are, that are gendered. But I think, Ray, you're probably a better place to talk about um, some of these issues than me. Well, I think, yeah, thanks. And I totally agree with everything you just said, actually. But um, I think one other thing we've got to think about is full-time employment doesn't necessarily, it's it, it's not necessarily what everyone wants, right? And I get the point that, you know, a lot of women are underemployed, but I think we've got to think about flex, what are we talking about when we talk about flexibility? Um, there's some really interesting questions in the chat about class. Um, and I think, I think we've got to grasp the nettle on that a bit. So I think a lot of the, and I'm guilty of it as well, a lot of the conversations we have about flexibility during COVID have been about knowledge workers. Um, it's about academics and economists and authors and, um, you know, um, the political classes kind of, kind of thing. It's not actually about the frontline workers. Um, and if we actually look at the frontline jobs, which is primarily occupied by women, they have lots of flexibility, but it's not good flex, right? It's really bad, they're bad jobs. Um, they are very socially and economically valuable. They keep us running, they keep us safe, but they're underpaid. Um, and they are in jobs where they are flexible in the way that they're oriented towards employer focused flexibility, where those workers don't have the capacity to control their schedules. So it's sort of the antithesis of being able to control um, your life if you can't control your working hours. And there's a, I don't know if people have seen it, there's a very interesting paper that, and a body of work that the SDA, the shop, Shoppies Union has done about that very issue and about those working class people who work in um, retail as their primary um, you know, income base have very little capacity to control the hours that they work, um, which means they have very little capacity to control their care, which means very little ability to also control what their wages are and get, you know, guarantee that each week. So I think rather than looking at full-time and part-time, I think we need to start talking a bit more about decent work and good jobs. Um, and the best way we can get at that is to actually start talking about decent work and good jobs in highly feminised sectors. So in some of those areas that Angela talked about, so childcare, aged care, um, in, in retail, 
um, in those areas where they're very customer facing um, and really important for keeping our economy and society running, but really underpaid, um, really, really underpaid, especially those, those care jobs. So I think that there's a false kind of dichotomy of full time and full employment. I think we need to think about even jobs that aren't full time need to be decent jobs and we need to work out the way that we can try to construct that. Um, we might switch to some audience questions. We've got one which is actually a pretty fundamental question from Angela Cox, who's asking, is there any data on the relative number of men versus women who've contracted COVID, um, particularly at work? Do we know anything about that? Um, I, do you know it, Angela? Um, or Jamil? No, I don't. I was thinking I was all over this last year. Yeah, now right. Um, so, I, okay. <laughs> so I think that I, I think that it's uh, okay. I think it is about the same. Like men and women are contracting it at about the same rate. It affects men much more strongly, particularly older men. Um, but I think there's a very strong class element actually to it. So it's it's um, lower paid men and lower paid women are both more likely to. Um, to contract the virus, if that, that's not really answering your question. But that's about the sorts of jobs where you're in contact all of the time with masses of people, um, yeah. whether that's in, um, you know, care or whether it's in uh, retail or uh, food services kind of areas. Um, I've read one story out of the, the um, sorry, paper out of the UK on that, but, yeah, I'm, re I'm really just talking to fill up space because I don't really know the answer. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure about the men and women. I know that uh, there's definitely uh, the socioeconomic. So I think the mortality last year in Australia from COVID was 2.6 times higher in the lowest socioeconomic group. So the lowest 20% of people compared to the highest 20%. So that mm -hmm. it's a massive difference if you think about it. Um, and that's because those people in the lower income are more likely to get it, but then also if they get it, more likely to die. So, um, you know, that, that gradient of health is, you know, a huge issue in Australia, but th that uh, that affects men and women. Yeah. Yeah. Look, on the subject, Ray mentioned older men. Um, Paul Loring's asked a series of questions and made a series of comments, which I, I think go to some of the communications challenges we might have in conveying what you've been discussing and, and more to the point, getting some action on it. Um, but also go to a bit of an equity issue. Paul's saying he's, a, he's an older male. Um, he was made redundant in his 50s. Um, his experience of the employment agencies were that they were predominantly staffed by younger females and that at the time he didn't appreciate he was being, in effect, he thought, permanently dumped on the scrap heap never to be properly employed again. To his mind, it's not just all about gender, it's also about the age of people of all genders who are affected by employment issues. Um, what, do you, what do you say to him, and more particularly because he, he makes the point that in having the sort of conversation we've been having tonight, it may well alienate people in his situation um, and make them feel even more excluded and rather than generate a consensus about doing something about all of these problems, it actually might divide people and set them against each other. Um, and you can see what the political reaction might be to some of that. Some people might decide, well, um, you know, either people like Paul are being excessively overlooked or will adopt a divide and conquer approach which would help no one. So yeah. how do we respond to what the sorts of sentiments I, that Paul is expressing? I think, you know, the, the sentiment is, you know, and I imagine everyone here tonight, we're, we're trying to solve some of the big social problems in Australia. And we're doing that because we want, you know, every Australian to live a great life and we want our country to be the best it can be. Now, doing that is not about treating everyone the same, right, and going, okay, we're just going to throw everybody in the same pot and everyone's the same, everyone's problems the same, same policies, doesn't matter. You need to look at, 
you know, what are the individual drivers? What's what's going on for different groups? What are the policy implications for that? How do how does a policy impact, you know, an older worker, an older male worker who needs probably different supports at that stage of his career than say someone in their twenties? No doubt about that. Um, but then there's also the issue around, you know, what are the supports for a migrant woman coming into Australia? Does our system cater for that? Not at all. Um, and and who is the system designed for, and who is it helping? Putting this lens on it, uh, what it shows us is that there's huge inequality between men and women. And, and we're not going to back away from that because there is, right? And it's undeniable. And all the stats show it. Men, uh, even though we're as educated, we earn less, um, we're more, more likely to be poor and more likely to be poor in older age. And so you can't you can't walk away from those issues that the system at the moment is generating this inequality. Um, but that doesn't mean that when you do have this gender lens, which also needs to have that intersectional lens on it to really be done properly, um, that that doesn't mean you don't actually get better policies for men and women, um, if that makes sense, because you're not trying to do a one size fits all mm -hmm. type approach. You're accounting for the fact that people have different needs and, you know, and there are different drivers at play. And, and that is how, we I think generate policies that we know number one what their effect is you know the biggest problem at the moment is we just do things and we don't even understand how they are going to impact different groups differently um, so we can actually understand what the true effect of a policy is going to be and then we can also ensure that everyone's getting you know the policies and the supports that they need to make the best contribution and have their best lives and at the moment we simply don't do that because of the way we design policy so, so my answer, I guess, is this helps everybody. Like equity does help everyone. Um, having a gender lens does help everyone. Um, and, you know, I would say certainly I would hope that employment services would treat older workers differently to younger workers. And if it's not, well, they need to be reformed to do that. I totally agree with everything you just said. Jamila, are you... <laughs> Me too, we're in fear. Is that sort of issue friendly. being discussed in your... Uh, I, mean, we, we, I mean, we're well aware that age discrimination exists within the, the Australian workforce and the Australian mm. community more broadly. Um, I think the framing of tonight's discussion and the relative experts you've brought to the table means that we've got a gender focus this evening. I would hope that Chifley will, and they mm. probably have, run uh, similar um, discussions that have a focus on age discrimination or age questions around the workforce, because it is a major question. You know, we talk again and again about whether or not the age pension uh, needs to be changed, whether or not that age needs to shift, and yet we don't see any real reform in that space. I don't think we speak honestly about the way we value older people in this country, and that's something we need to work at. The one thing I would, I would say is I think we all need to be better at thinking about discrimination that occurs beyond what affects us personally. I think that's an important thing for all of us to do. And I count myself in that category. Um, I became disabled uh, two years ago and have had my eyes opened up to the discrimination and the difficulties of a life for someone with severe disabilities. And I'm kind of embarrassed that it wasn't something I had ever put a lot of work into before that, that it wasn't something I'd researched, that it wasn't something I'd have taken the time to understand until it was about me. Um, I think that's a space in which I could have done better. So I think if there are men watching tonight who are listening to this discussion and thinking, but hey, what about my experience of X or my experience of Y? Sometimes it's worth taking a moment and saying, tonight we're talking about the experience of women and I'm going to listen to some women. We might just close with uh, something that's been prompted by my chair because I, I always have to listen to my chair. And Linda White uh, points to something that Lisa Darman said in the chat um, about policymakers not always wanting to spend the money to fix things like the wage problem for, for women, um, because if it involves a government response, you know, that money's got to be found um, out of consolidated revenue. And if it involves an employer response, you know, you've got to do something about the wages versus profit share, and that's not always an easy thing to ask of employers. Um, and we've just come through a period of you know, probably 35, 40 years where, you know, there's been a particularly strong ideological bias to ensure that policy makers 
pay a lot of attention to you know, wage, wage pressures, et cetera, et cetera. How do we deal with these money problems? Can I, can I go first on that one? So just thinking about someone like Linda mm -hmm. White and Lisa Damien and the work that they have both done through their working lives to represent low paid women, um, I would say that in those kinds of sectors um, where we have highly feminized, very precaritized, um, low paid work that is really, really important um, to our community, to our society and actually to our economy, um, it is going to cost money to increase the wages of workers who work in disability care, aged care, um, child care, um, early childhood education. Um, but the return you get on some of, some of that investment um, doesn't just benefit you know, the workers involved. It actually is really important for leveraging um, productivity, for le leveraging growth across the um, economy. Um, and, you know, Jamila pretty eloquently put it before about, you know, the, all the sort of triple wins that you get out of um, building gender equality. So if government's purpose is actually to lift us up and to build a better society and to make sure that we, you know, we have equality and support, then that should be what government does. Um, so it will be expensive to lift wages in those kind of sectors, but we've seen small little gems of where that's happened. So the Australian Services Union, where both of those uh, women who sent that question are from, did some amazing work um, with government when Julia Gillard was the Prime Minister around lifting the wages of um, workers in the community services sector. And that was government making a choice that they would actually fund those wage increases. Um, we should expect our governments to be better and we should be expecting them to, um, you know, prioritise both the decency of work in those sectors, but also just how important they are to our society and to our economy. Yeah, I'll just add the economic modelling on this is pretty clear that you lift the wages and the number of workers, particularly in aged care, um, and the returns are just huge for the economy. Um, and it actually generates quite a lot of male jobs as well, just because of the multiplier effect. Um, but what it does is it, you know, at the moment we have a shortage of aged care workers, that's going to get worse. We are going to have to pay these workers more if we're going to want to properly, you know, provide aged care services in this country going forward. Um, and it obviously generates extra demand because those workers have more wages, but it also that those caring hours um, are a huge productivity boost because it means there's another generally a woman but also men who do informal caring it reduces that informal caring and so it increases your overall labor supply so the economic benefits of investing in care far outweigh investing in physical infrastructure um, and you know it needs to be it is a it is a mind shift I understand that and I understand you know people like bridges people like roads but investing in your people and the care of your people is just a huge driver of economic growth um, and can set the country up for a much more prosperous future because it means we're all doing what we're best at um, and, you know, and being paid for it properly. I think it's also just worth noting that um, a lot of those jobs are not only filled by women, but they're filled by migrant women. And yep. we are moving into a period where people are going to move around the world in a different way to, they to how they have in the 10 years previous. We can't rely on migrant men and women to fill those aged care jobs in particular. And that's a sector that is absolutely going to boom. And we're all going to have to rely on one day or another. And you want that properly staffed. And if you're going to attract Australians into those roles, especially with a lack of migrant workforce, you're going to have to pay them better. Well, on that note, um, I'd like to, to thank you all, Jamila, Angela, Ray. Um, thank everyone in the audience. My apologies for causing some technical snafus <laughs> at the start of the conversation, but you managed to uh, get us through it, through it all. Um, and we've closed on the note of human capital, broadly speaking, um, which is a good segue into what we'll be doing next week. Next week, our guest will be uh, Tanya Plebisek, and we'll be talking about the higher education sector um, and where we go with it. And again, it'll be another conversation about what we inherited pre-COVID, what the impact of COVID has been, whether COVID, has, uh, COVID will be a catalyst for change for the good, or whether it's just once more revealed some fundamental problems that no one's really going to tackle. So there'll be some of the things that we'll be talking about with Tanya next week. Um, in the meantime, everyone stay safe, get vaccinated, and thank you very much. Bye.
All right. Thanks, everyone. You're well, more than welcome yeah. to head off now and uh, have a lovely rest of the week. And thanks for such a great discussion. Yeah. Thanks, thanks guys. Thanks, David. Thanks, Jan. Thanks, Thank Ray. You. That was amazing. Thanks very much. Yes, yeah. <laughs> sharing and very funny. <laughs> I know I love seeing your children, so that was oh, okay. Thank nice. you. Yeah. yeah, star turn. See you later. Have a great yeah. night, everyone.